Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be joined by Mo McRae to talk about his latest feature film, A Lot of Nothing, in which he is the writer, producer, and director of, as well as his current turn in HBO Max's The Flight Attendant. And, and starting with talking about your movie, you know, you have such extensive experience as an actor, but also you've worked in photography for a number of years. And so even when you were writing the script, I was really interested on what was your initial in point in figuring out the visual language and the visual way that you wanted to tell the story because it's got so many specific visual choices in terms of the aesthetics and the camera work throughout the film. Oh, that's such a great question. Thank you. Um, the entry point for the visual language on this film, it to be completely honest, it was, it was a combination of like so many different things. And there are a few collaborators on that, which I'll get to. But for me personally, it was really leaning into the way when I think of cinema and I think of film in my mind, it's pretty much in those formative years of my life and what movies look like in like the 90s when I was coming up in the 80s. So it was very much trying to get something that felt like it was modern and contemporary but could also exist in the same canon as those films from that era so like very much movies that were shot on film shot on kodak you know certain stocks in the 80s and 90s is kind of the inspo initially and then working with the two cinematographers that worked on the film john kang and john rosario we pulled inspiration from a lot of photography from people like Gordon Parks or even Avedon and the different films and books. So it was like a really broad scope of places to pull inspiration. But at the beginning of it, it was very much just the, the early movies, my early, my early experience with cinema. Mm -hmm. And also in terms of the themes and the topics of the film, it feels like that's very influential in a lot of the shot choices as well. You know, and if we if we look at the use of mirrors in shots as kind of a reflection um, and the fact that in speaking about the film, you said that you really want this movie to cause the audience to have reflections on themselves for the characters to be going through reflections within the story. And so how did the themes and topics influence a lot of the choices that you made with the camera as well? Oh, that's, man, this is my kind of uh, interview right here. This is exciting. Uh, I love getting to talk about this stuff because we all put so much thought and detail into a, every choice about where the camera was and what we wanted to say with the visual language. And so I always considered this piece as a reflection piece, as like a, as a, a mirror to ourselves and society, but it was a funhouse mirror nonetheless and that's why everything is slightly heightened and elevated and distorted and the absurdist element is there but in terms of like the mirrors in the actual film i thought it would be really cool to just reflect each moment that the character was experienced from more than one angle the angle that the camera is picking up and then the angle that's happening in the reflection of that same thing and it's like and most of the time in those moments in the film the character is not looking at themselves which i thought was also interesting to have your reflection right in front of you but you're never looking at it or you're not even aware of what you're projecting or reflecting depending on how you're looking at it so that was like a motif that we want to have throughout of plan with uh this film as a as a societal macro and micro level reflection and then having literal uh, visual language that imply the same thing. And the film really centers around around this couple and these two characters, Vanessa and James, and, and their marriage and what happens when these external forces come into play within that dynamic. Um, and I, I wanted to ask about the script writing process when it came to these two characters and it came to their relationship and how you found the ways to express and tell the audience details about their relationship that they as characters know to be true, but the audience doesn't know yet. You know, it's like if a character says, oh, I take the trash out every Tuesday, day they both already know that and so how did you find the dialogue to really bring a lot of that to the surface and and bring the audience into that well i think with the if i'm understanding your question correctly i feel like the truth of these characters and their and their backstories and everything about their existence was really rooted in my own personal experiences mm -hmm. So it's like one of the most cliche things I've ever heard. And I've heard so much about like, just write from what you know. And I really just took that idea and ran with it. So like those, each one of the five 
uh, like central characters in the film they're all inspired by real people from my life so I let that kind of inform the way everything would happen and, and just try to write from a true place and then a place that felt um, entertaining mm -hmm. as well like just thinking about it as an audience member and then I got to a point where I had because I started off writing I wrote it as a short film first and then spend the next few years developing as a feature and, and working with a lot of wonderful people and my producers and and developing the script and i got to a point where there were a lot of really great notes that had come in and i knew that especially for like some of the women in the film that i wanted to be respectful and authentic so i brought in someone else uh sarah kelly kaplan to help kind of like in the later stages of the writing process to just bring a, a fresh point of view and perspective on it all. I mean, and with the idea of, of notes, you know, there's so many stages of the filmmaking process where you have other people reading the script, looking at footage in the editing room, looking at early cuts where you're getting feedback and you're getting notes and, um, you know, you've kind of talked about part of your process in the past being very much that you're always very open to receiving a lot of it, but there are moments where you're very adamant and you're very certain about choices, um, you know, such as the opening being one scene for 17 minutes in a single take. And so what were the overall choices that you knew that you had to be really adamant with yourself about and stick to your guns on? And what were some of the spaces where, you know, you were a little bit more open to some of that feedback and some of the elements evolved in the script or the film because of that? Well, in terms of the opening, I was like, I always, like, I'm a very um, visual thinker when it comes to, like, you know, art in general and storytelling. Like, I just see things in my head. And I was always just enamored with watching this couple's dynamic unfold real time with no cuts for an extended period of time is like the prologue for the film. So that was one of those things where it was a, a non-negotiable for me, like whoever was going to come on board had to come on board with the idea that the opening of the film is going to be a very extended one take, a true one take with no hidden cuts that would require the actors, uh, uh, every set deck, cinematographer, lighting, everybody to work together for that. So that was the area. And then some of the major plot points were non-negotiables for me as well in terms of like, these are the things that I really need to say, and this is the way I wanna say them. Now, the areas that were extremely collaborative kind of fell within the parameters of what <clears throat> I knew we wanted to say, and somebody would present a different way of saying it. Like sometime maybe like, I was thinking the camera should be here, and my cinematographer was like, no, wait, if we move it over three feet, and I'm like, okay, yeah, that's great. Or even like the actors would just find moments sometimes that, that could bring infuse levity in the moment that I thought was serious or vice versa. And I was always open to those types of things. And a lot of that comes from having the right collaborators on a project as well. And you know, in the in the casting process and building your crew, it sounds like one of the important elements wasn't just who is gonna be the right actor for this role, who's going to be the right person to hire for this job. But it was about making sure that people were really connected to the story that you were telling and the way that you wanted to tell it. Um, you know, was that just about having conversations or just kind of naturally getting a sense of, of their passion and their connection to the story that you were telling in this film? Yeah, I think the, uh, the conversations at the onset may have been the most important part of the entire process with people, because I... You know, I'm trying to think. So I'm just be extremely like candid, transparent about the kind of person that I am. Even though I know some people might find it to be off putting, but this is my truth and my reality. I was like, my goal was to make a masterpiece. I wanted to make something that I felt like in my heart, my goal and my intention was to make a masterpiece, something that was compelling and, and um, well crafted. And also I knew it would be polarizing in that fact that I was doing things the way I want to do it and things that were unique. And that's something that some people love and embrace and other people don't get it and they don't connect to it. So I say that to say that that goal and the idea of me making a masterpiece is something that I would share in initial meetings with people. 
So I would sit across from the editor and ask what they thought about the script and this and that. And I'll say, well, all right, so my goal is to make a masterpiece. And some people would hear that and squirm. It would make them uncomfortable. And other people would hear it and lean into it like, yeah, I think we can do that. I think this has, and I lean towards the people that were not afraid of that type of pursuit and that type of language. And I really lean towards the people that said, well, if you want this to be a masterpiece, I think you're gonna need to fix some things. And those are the people I got really excited about, the people that were able to have that open, transparent conversation about areas they felt needed improvement on the page or in a specific scene or in the edit, wherever we were in the process, the people that were like, okay, you want this to be a masterpiece, but I don't think this feels compelling <laughs> in this moment here. And those, I, that was it. So it was very much like, having conversations with people, being sure that we had the same desire in terms of what the final product would be and the impact that we were hoping to have with it. I really love hearing hearing that detail. And, you know, you were bringing up editing as part of the process there. And there's such specific editing in, in this film. You know, even just the choice to not have a cut in those first 17 minutes is, is an editing choice. And, and then which take do you use, which has the best flow, the best performance, the best, you know, kind of step by step of where you wanted the camera to be and everything landing in the right space, you know, and then at the same time, you're also using editing in those moments where you want to build up tension, you're using editing as well, when you want to kind of slow the audience down a little bit and allow them just those intimate connections with the characters on screen. And so what did that part look like in terms of the filmmaking process? Because, you know, that's, that's another reimagining of the story that you've just filmed and that you've written in that space. Yeah, the editing process was beautiful and extremely challenging at the same time because my editor, who I love dearly, Annie Ifri, who has so much heart and so much skill, and she's, she brings a lot of emotion into the cutting room because that then kind of transfers through her heart and her hands into the screen. And that process, some days I, I would feel like, oh, I don't know the answers. Everything that I thought was working doesn't. And then some days I would feel like things that didn't work, we found and we cracked the code and discovered the magic. So it was really, a, um, it, it was a, like like many great things I think that you accomplish life on the other side of it it's like amazing but when i look back on it it was like a very challenging process to be completely honest because it was my first feature and so i'm looking at this thing that i had in my mind in my heart and now i have all the pieces and sometimes the pieces aren't lining up to what i envisioned and i don't know how to make that happen and then sometimes i'll make it be exactly what i wanted it to be and discover it doesn't have the effect that I would hope. And that's where somebody like Annie, who's such a genius and a beautiful artist, comes in and she just always, ultimately, I feel like we found the right pattern for all the pieces, the right pace for the dance. It's like, this is like, you talk about like pacing, like when do you slow it down? When do you increase it? When do you let it breathe? Like, it's not trial and, and not trial and error, but it was like trial and discovery is what I would say throughout the editing process. Like having a very specific plan, but then being willing to throw that plan out if it didn't lead to the desired uh, emotional context for what it is. And in talking a little bit more intricately about what it takes to film a 17 minute one, one shot, you know, especially because that's the opening of the film. That's the audience's first step into this world that you've created our first introduction to these characters. And so it's so much more than just the logistical element of, of, everybody landing what they need to in one take across 17 minutes. It's about bringing that connection and finding the emotion in it as well. You know, the performance that your actors are giving. And so how did you kind of logistically set it up with everybody and, and map out the choreography, but then also make sure that it was going to track all the emotional beats that you needed it to? One word, rehearsal. As rehearsal, my uh, producing partner, Annie Clemens, 
who has extensive background in acting as an acting coach and was very helpful with me and the actors as I would always spend a lot of time with John Rosario, my cinematographer, so that we could create an environment <clears throat> where we knew all the beats. And we found the beats and then it was just a matter of like, okay, this is the emotional trajectory. Now, where does the camera need to be to capture that? I also wanted to talk specifically about the scene at which Vanessa and James go to their neighbor's house, um, played by Justin Hartley, because that's such a pivotal moment in the film. And that really sets off the entire, you know, second half of, of the story and what this dynamic is going to be throughout. And again, there's a lot of intricacies in that moment in terms of character, but also what does the audience see and when and how are they interpreting the information that that they're being given, um, you know, and so there's a difference in when it's just her showing up on the doorstep where the camera is, then when it's the two of them there together during that confrontation, and then everything that leads into that moment, you know, what is he reaching for? Is it what we think it is? Is it something different? Um, and so how did you figure out the real delicacy and balances that came with a scene like that? Well, I mean, these questions are so beautiful because they're so like insightful and specific, like, the, the big thing with that scene was um, playing with perspective and how we experience those things in, those, in real time. So that kind of informed all the choices about where the camera would be, I was thinking about what does Vanessa see in that moment, how obstructed her view is, <laughs> and then kind of just navigating from like real world and also putting the audience in a situation where they can't really process the reality of it because it's happening so fast and they don't get a clear picture either. Right, totally. I mean, I, I re think I rewound that scene even to watch it over again to try and see what we were seeing in that moment. And and I love that description of, of perception and really using the camera in that form. Were there other scenes and moments in the film where you really wanted to play around with that idea of what's the audience's perception and what are they seeing in the same way? Yeah, I felt like in the... Uh the hospital it was another moment of playing with the perception so when the baby is taken away and then the focus goes soft and it's like for candy and jamal in that moment they don't know what's going on so the baby is going into the unknown so just playing with the perspective there was a big one mm -hmm. and jumping into to spoiler territory a little bit towards the end of the film that closing montage of shots is I can't even describe it because there's so many different emotions that that creates in watching it. And again, you could watch that scene five times and walk away with a different emotion and a different feeling every time and a different interpretation and perspective. And so how did you set about figuring out with your actors what you wanted them to be giving the camera, what you wanted them to be portraying, and also some of the ambiguity that you wanted to leave the audience with as well, especially when you were editing together between the different cuts of them all? It was this idea of processing. Like I wanted to, it was two big things at play, two P words actually. It was processing and portraiture. So that's what the ending was. It was like having them sit in everything that they're feeling and process it, whatever that was that was truthful for them. And from a photographic um, standpoint, it was capturing a, a portrait, almost like a family portrait that was honest and real with no no pretense or no no facade, like a fake smile or or a fake air of dignity or anything like that. It was just like really experience and process everything that's transpired. And then I'm just gonna come in and just capture it and then cut in between so you can see the juxtaposition of what that led to. No, it's a, it's a really beautiful ending with a lot of complexity and, and jumping over into talking a little bit about the flight attendant, you know, coming into a show in season two is always such an interesting journey as, as an actor, because there's such an opportunity to look at the episodes and what the show has already been doing. And especially for a show like the flight attendant mm -hmm. that has a very specific 
tone in the way it tells its story. You know, a lot of the cast who worked on season one talked about that journey of really having to figure it out. And so when you were coming on board season two, already being a fan of the show, already having watched it, what were some of the details that you started honing in on or keying in on that really gave you a sense of the tone when it came to how you were shaping your character and what you wanted your performance to be? Well, I felt like it was um, the first season. Part of what was so cool about the flight attendant as a segue from <clears throat> discussing a lot of nothing is that on a lot of levels, it's actually quite similar when you think about it in terms of handling thematically difficult, challenging, and even dark subject matter in, a, in an absurdist type of way with an attention to like some of the um the uh, the tools of the medium to make it feel well crafted so that's what my film was and that's kind of who i am as an artist so, like i like this idea of melting tone and, and and all this stuff so i was a fan of the flight attendant and then going into joining the second season one thing i wanted to craft and find with my character was how to almost fulfill and deliver on the promise of the premise of the show from the first season. So how does my character have all of those amazing colors that make the show great? And the writers did an incredible job of presenting me a character that gave me the opportunity to have all those colors. So he's serious and, and funny at times and kind of charming within potentially dangerous and mysterious. So all those colors are there. And for me, it was about just trying to figure out where they were and we're not going to highlight them. And, you know, with the fact that your character is, is Cassie's CIA handler, there's a lot of stress that comes with that because she's not someone who follows instructions very well. She often does all the things she's told not to do, but the, 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 the moments where the two of you are having those disagreements and, and he's kind of berating her a little bit for it. were so interesting in terms of your character, because it feels like there's a certain projection in terms of the standards that he holds himself to that were coming through. And so did you view any of the, the frustrations that he has with Cassie about the perfectionism that he's really striving for in his own life and his own world? Yeah, for sure. I felt like he, <clears throat> There's a lot of frustration because he takes it all serious, like you said, and then there's also a lot of uh, admiration, I think, in that thing of like seeing someone else on the total end of the spectrum and you can have disdain towards that person. But then also there's an opportunity, what I found with this character, to almost have a respect for that carefree nature. And there's also like a bit of like almost some wish fulfillment in there. Of like, damn, I wish I could be more like her in certain ways. Although she's a mess, there's still like an effervescence to her. There's a charisma about that character that I think my character respected and gravitated towards and developed an affinity for. Her. And you're also playing a character that the audience is seeing through their professional setting, which kind of gives a lot of latitude in terms of, of building out their backstory and a lot of the details that are happening for that character off screen. Um, and so what was your process of figuring out his backstory, figuring out a lot of the details that make him who he is in that setting in the workplace that we then get to see? I was the annoying kid in class that always had questions for the teacher. So it was like just pestering um, the gracious and lovely Steve, Yaki, and uh, Natalie Chad. I was just like, can we have a Zoom? Can we have a phone call? I have questions. What is he doing? You mentioned he has this book in his office. Did he read that book? Like, I just wanted to know everything I could from the minds of the people that created the character and use that to establish the parameters for my imagination to then fill out the rest to try to make him feel like he has a life outside of the office in some history and a point of view. Like that's my big thing with every character and every, excuse me, everything I do artistically is like <clears throat> discovering the point of view. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love those details and it's it's been so great watching your performance in the first few episodes of the season. And I'm so excited and intrigued to see where it goes next. And also congratulations on, on everything with your film and its recent premiere at South by. Thank you so much, Mo. Thank you so much for making the time. Thank you.